So let's delve into experiment one, your first lab at TCC. If this is your first time taking it, it might be your first time being exposed to laboratory experiments and lab techniques. This lab is specifically designed to get you comfortable with those techniques, comfortable with the equipment we use, comfortable with the terminology, and comfortable calculations. So make sure to read the background information on this lab pretty intensely. It's got a lot of great tips and tricks that were put together by the faculty for your use, and they did a great job on it. I really appreciate the document or the lab manual they put together for you. It is a bit long for the first experiment just because we are trying to describe so many techniques to you and such, but again, they put a lot of work into this, so let's take advantage of that work. Please read through it diligently and make any notes or email me any questions you have, but I'm going to try to summarize some of the more basic parts of what we're actually doing in the classroom itself here for you. So experiment one is just entitled Scientific Measurement. Again, this is for the TCC Northeast Campus lab manuals. Every campus is slightly different, so TCC Northeast Campus Lab Manual. The objectives in this lab is being able to convert, record, take, and calculate. So what are we converting? We're converting between units using conversion factors. We've talked about conversion factors in class. Now we're going to start applying those conversion factors. Things like if I go measure something with a meter stick, how do I know how many inches that is? That is a conversion. You're going to record and with this, you need to be able to record the correct number of significant figures for a measurement, as well as, don't forget units. You need to record the correct number of sig figs, which also includes your units, but you also need to understand how to use the correct sig figs when, making it, when completing calculations. You're going to take measurements accurately, whether it be a balance, a graduated cylinder, a burette, a ruler, etc. These are all different things we're going to use throughout the semester, using the techniques featured in the procedure here. And then calculate error and percent error. So how accurate, are, how accurate and precise are your measurements? A little bit of a review. If you're confused on the material or you're getting real stuck and you don't know where to go back to, Module 1A is where we covered your metric prefixes and your temperature conversions. Module 1B is where we talked about what is a measurement. We talked about uncertainty, random and systematic error, and significant figures. As a little bit of a review there, um, metric prefixes, you just got to memorize the set of them that we talked about, temperature, converting, the one I expect you to memorize is converting between Celsius and Kelvin. I will not expect you to memorize converting between Kelvin, I'm mean, sorry, between Fahrenheit and Celsius. I will give you that conversion, but you will have to use that conversion every so often in class. What is a measurement? A measurement is what do you think a value is of something, but measurements always include units as well. Remember, a measurement also includes certain digits and uncertain digits. It includes our uncertainty. So we have to factor that uncertainty into the measurements we're making in class today. Random and systematic error. Random error is just that. It's random. We can't stop it. We just take more and more measurements to try to minimize the random error of a measurement. We use more and more accurate um, or more and more precise instruments, better calibrated instruments to try to minimize our error. A systematic error is an error that's always in one direction and is due to some type of specific thing happening. Oftentimes it's from a student with a certain technique that they haven't mastered it yet, so they're causing a systematic error. Or an instrument that's been calibrated incorrectly. Maybe an instrument was calibrated and it's off by five millimeters. It's always going to be off by that five millimeters until it's correctly calibrated. And of course, significant figures. Looking at your sig figs understanding how to identify the correct number of sig figs within a measurement, being able to complete calculations with sig figs, and using conversion factors. Here is a series of conversion factors that they have provided in your lab manual. Some of these you will have to memorize for class. So distance, you do need to know that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. You need to know that that is an exact conversion, meaning it does not limit the number of significant figures you have. We also have one kilometer equal to 0.621 miles, one mile, 5,280 feet. I will not require you to memorize those two conversions. I'm going to highlight the conversions you're expected to know. Your mass and your weight, one pound is 16 ounces, is 453.6 grams. I do it with one less sig fig and say one pound is 454 grams. But this does have three sig figs to it. So you can memorize either one of these, I don't care. But you have to know how many sig figs it is. One ton is 2,000 pounds. One gram is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd AMU. Temperature, again, Fahrenheit and Celsius conversions between each other. 
I will not, um, I will provide that calculation. I won't expect you to memorize that one, but do note that the 1.8 and 32 here are exact numbers. So they don't limit our sig figs. You do need to know that Kelvin is equal to degree C plus 273.15. The 273.15 is not exact. That is five sig figs there. And so if we're doing calculation, we have to be able to pay attention whether we're doing multiplication, division, or addition, subtraction on that calculation. Here we're doing addition, so we have to pay attention to the number of sig figs, or number of decimal places in our measurements. <coughs> Excuse me. Pressure, we're going to deal with this in chapter 6. So you won't have to memorize these conversions yet, but they are coming. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury, is 760 torr, is 14.7 psi, is 1.013 bar. You will have to memorize those in chapter 6. Volume, one mil is one cubic centimeter. We usually write it like this. You do need to know that. One liter is one decimeter cubed. One fluid ounce, 29.6 mils. One quart is four cups, is 0.9464 liters. One gallon is four quarts, and one foot cubed is 7.481 gallons. So again, what's highlighted is what you're going to have to memorize for my class. The rest will be provided. Looking a little more at accuracy and precision in some of the glassware you're using, you're going to use two different types of glassware in class today. But some of the types of glassware we have, volumetric glassware, graduated glassware, and other glassware. Volumetric glassware. This is called a volumetric flask. And they are most often precise to the second decimal place. They're a very accurate piece of glassware because they're calibrated to such precision. So if I had 250 mil volumetric flask, it would actually be 250.00 mils. There's a line on the flask that we fill it up to, and if we fill it right to that line, we know we have exactly that much glassware, or that much volume. This is called a burette. We're going to use this in uh, experiment five or six, six. Experiment six is the first we're gonna use pirouette. We can also have volumetric pipettes and they may or may not go to the second or first decimal place. This is a volumetric pipette. It depends on the pipette itself, the graduations on it, how precise it is. And a graduated pipette. Again, we say that they measure to this, this is an estimation, the graduate pipette may measure to one, de to one decimal place, it may measure to two, depending on how the, um, how the pipette itself is graduated. And graduated cylinder. And then much less accurate, Erlenmeyer flasks. And beakers. They tend to measure to about a mil, meaning that about uh, that, that one mil I'm saying about is our uncertainty in the measurement. And we do have our percent error calculation that we will be using in lab today. So experimental value minus true value over true value. Notice here that we are taking the absolute value. So when we take the difference between those values, it, absolute value means that you make that difference positive. So regardless of the number is positive or negative, we make it positive. We do that because we don't really care about the directionality of the air. We just care what the air is. Sometimes we'll care about directionality of air, but not on percent air. On percent air, we just want to know how close it is to the true measured value. Remember when you're measuring things, um, we have to consider sig figs. So all measurements have some degree of uncertainty. We indicate the reliability of these measurements with the use of significant figures. To report a measurement, record all the certain digits plus the first uncertain digit. So if this, I was looking at this cylinder here, and I want to measure it, what am I going to do? Well, this line here is called your meniscus. And you always want to read, this is hard to draw, at the bottom of this meniscus. Let's see if I can get it at the bottom of the meniscus. We want to read the volume at the bottom of that meniscus. What we want is we want our eye level with the bottom of that meniscus. Why is water doing this? Why are aqueous solutions? Aqueous is a fancy word to mean dissolved in water. Sorry, let me pick up you can, or size you can see. Dissolved in water. Not all, but most of the solutions you use in a Gen Chem lab are aqueous solutions, dissolved in water. We have things dissolved into water. 
water really likes glass. So what happens is water travels up the sides of the glass so it can hang up a little bit more, so it can touch the glass, it really likes it. But we have to read the volume at the bottom of that meniscus to get a true, accurate reading of the volume of the system. So we're gonna read it right here. So again, how am I gonna report this measurement? Okay, I know I'm reading at the bottom of the meniscus. I know that this value is between 50 and 60 mils because I see the 50 mils here, I see the 60 mils here. So let's say I know X is less than 60 mils, but is greater than 50 mils. Well, these lines here represent ones. So 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, and 60. So what am I going to do with that information? Well, I'm going to say, okay, well, clearly my line is greater than 55, but less than 57. Some people are going to say it's right on the 56 mil mark. They're going to say x is equal to 56. That is not quite correct for two reasons. One, we forgot units. But two, the 56 is what I can exactly measure. We also have to include our final uncertain digit in the measurement. So we can write 56.0. If you think it's right on the line of 56, that is fine. You can write it. But you have to write 56.0 to show my zero is my uncertainty. Someone may say, I think it's just below, 59.9 mils. Looking at that line, they might say 59.9 mils. Totally correct. Someone could say 56.1 mils. 55.8 mils. All of those are correct measurements. They're all including their certain digits and the one digit of uncertainty. Proper use of balances, please make sure to read through the power or the handout itself, the lab manual itself, to see um, how it describes to use the balance in the labs. The lab the balances in your labs are very, very nice. They're very well kept. Um, they put a lot of work into it. So you can see what can happen when a balance is not properly maintain, maintained. If you spill something, it happens, it's okay. But if you spill something, there is a little brush next to the balance. Go ahead and brush off the balance. Brush it all out of the system itself. All off the balance, out of this area, out the door. If you aren't sure what to do with it, leave the chemical on the counter, come tell me. I'll go clean it up, that's fine. If you feel a little more confident, you can get a paper towel, sweep that chemical onto the paper towel and dump it in the proper waste container. If you're not sure, just come tell me and I'll, I'll take care of it, that's fine, I don't mind. But please do not leave chemicals on the balances themselves. So procedure, what are you gonna do? Part A is looking at temperature. You're gonna measure the temperature of air, basically room temperature. You're gonna measure the temperature of an ice water bath. You're gonna measure the temperature of a boiling water bath. So first you should be prepare your ice bath and prepare your hot water bath because they're gonna take time to cool down the water and heat up the water. In one 50, 250 ml beaker, you're gonna fill it about three fourths full with ice. To this beaker, you're gonna add tap water this tap water basically fills up the space between the ice um, ice cubes themselves, covering the ice. So make sure to add enough water that you've covered the ice. Go ahead and stir that with a scoopula. A scoopula is a metal spatula that's curved. It looks like a little scoop. Don't stir with thermometers. Thermometers are expensive. Scoopulas are pieces of metal. It can eventually break a scoopula, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of work, a lot of use of it. Thermometer is much easier to break. Please do not stir with your thermometer. They're expensive and we don't want them to break. Prepare your boiling water bath. You're going to fill about 250 ml beaker, about three fourths full with tap water. Add two to three boiling chips. A boiling chips can be found at the front of the room. I'll show you guys where. Boiling chips are just little inert. They look like little rocks. They're a little inert material that just helps the water boil more evenly so you can get a nice gentle boil going. Place the beaker on the hot plate on high and you need to wait for it to boil. You can't take the temperature until it's actually boiling. Using a thermometer, you're going to record the temperature in Celsius and make sure to consider your sig figs. If you've got a system, sorry, I could not draw a straight line. If you've got a thermometer,
that's measured every one's place, then in the temperatures here, you're going to estimate between 30 and 31. You're going to say 30 point something, one decimal place here. You could say 30.2 degrees C. One decimal place, it's your one degree of uncertainty. If it's marked to the tens place, you're going to write down that. Number. You're going to write down the um, second decimal place, the hundreds place. Make sure to, um, you're going to record the temperature of just the room. So what is the temperature in the room? You take the temperature of the ice bath and the temperature of the boiling water bath. Look at your procedure. They want you doing this with a ring stand and clamp for security on the thermometer. So you've got your beaker with your ice or your boiling water. You're going to have a ring stand next to it that's going to be holding a clamp that holds your thermometer into the solution. Your thermometer should not touch the bottom of the glassware. The bottom of the glassware is going to be a different temperature than the solution itself. Make sure that you're clamping this though properly. Part of it is to teach you use of clamping. Part of it is to keep the thermometer safe. Be really cautious when you're doing the boiling water bath. Um, I don't want you guys to get burned, so be very careful because, you know, obviously boiling water is very hot. It's um, in Fahrenheit. It's 212 degrees Fahrenheit where water boils. Part B, measuring your length. So it wants you to measure width and length of a paper from your lab manual, watching your sig figs. I don't care if you do a single paper. I don't care if you do the whole lab manual. I don't care if you do your textbook. I don't care what you measure. It's really just about getting that um, calculation in and practicing that calculation. And I apologize. I keep forgetting to superscript these values. One day I'll remember. But you're going to measure the width and length. Make sure to watch for sig figs. If you, it's telling you to measure it in centimeters. So if you've got something, if you've got your ruler here, and you're measuring every one centimeter, I know this is not one centimeter. I know one centimeter is bigger than this. But let's just say we've got it like this, and your value comes right here. You need to measure three point something centimeters, one decimal place there. You're always estimating that one digit, never more than that. So calculate the lab manual's area in centimeters cubed. So you've measured its length and its width. Now you're going to convert to centimeters cubed and then convert that to inches or um, squared. I keep saying cubed, squared, and then convert it to inches squared. And part C is measuring mass and volume. You're going to return the mass of a 10 mil graduate cylinder and a 50 mil beaker. You can add 10 mils of tap water to the beaker. There is graduations on the beaker itself. So you're going to add it to the 10 mil mark on the beaker. Go ahead and wear the weak beaker and the water. You're going to add 10 mils of water to the graduate cylinder, and that, I apologize, should say cylinder. Weigh the cylinder and the water. Determine the mass of the water in both systems. Assume the density of water is 1 gram per mil. Determine the volume of water and calculate your percent air for each measurement. Here's a little bit of an example on how this can actually work. So this is um, data from the, um, my other students. A student determined the accuracy of a beaker. They measured the mass of an empty beaker. They added about 30 mils of water to their beaker and recorded the added volume. So they measured the mass of an empty beaker and found it to be 28.14 grams for trial 1 and 27.90 grams for trial 2. Different masses because they were just different beakers. They just used two different beakers. They then added about 30 mils of water to the beaker and recorded the added volume. So they added, they recorded they added 33 mils. If you add exactly 10 mils, write down 10 with a decimal place on the end. If you write if you write exactly 10, if you think you measured out exactly 10, it'd be 10 point mils. They felt that they recorded or added 33 mils. They measured the temperature of the water to determine the density of water at this temperature. Now, I do provide them a table that shows them the specific density at specific temperatures. You guys are going to assume one gram per mil. So you don't have to worry about that, that part specifically, but water density does change with temperature. Using the density of water and the mass of water to determine the true volume of the water delivered to the beaker and calculate the percent air. So they took their mass of the beaker with water, subtracted the mass of the empty beaker, and calculated the mass of just the water. They then used the density. Density is mass over volume. So volume is mass over density. To calculate the true volume in the beaker. They did that again for trial two as well. So this is how much they actually added was 30.63 mils. They thought they had added 33 mils. They then calculated their percent error. Remember when you're doing calculations on sig figs? So percent error, 33 mils minus 30.63 mils, absolute value, divided by 30.63 mils, 
times 100%. When I took that 33 mils minus the 30.63, let's see, 33 minus 30.63 gave me 2.37 divided by 30.63 mils times 100%. But this calculation right here, this 33 minus 30.63, this is accurate to the ones place right here. Or precise, sorry. This is precise to the ones place. It's precise to the hundredths place. But that means my final answer is only precise to the ones place. So this act, I'm going to keep the 2.37 in the full calculation to not create round off error. But I realize that this has one sig fig in it. Hence, my final answers here, each having one sig fig. So then you're going to determine the number of sig figs, calculations with sig figs, true, false, and if thermometer... Um, how thermometers are reading. This is for your pre-lab. Pre-lab number one, question number one, if you're confused on how to determine number of sig figs, see module 1b for review. If you're confused on doing calculations with sig figs for question two, see module 1c for review. True or false? I want you to think about some questions here. Think about the proper lab technique and can you answer the question? State why it's correct or correct the statement as appropriate. You should hold a graduated cylinder to eye level take a volume reading. What do you guys think? It is talked about in your background information. You should read the volume from the middle of the meniscus. The balances should only be zero teared by the instructor. You must shake down a laboratory thermometer and water is boiling when you see tiny bubbles form on the bottom of the beaker. All of these things are discussed in the background information in detail. Number four, if the balance reads 35.930 grams, what should you record on your report? Remember when you have a digital readout, the very last number written is your uncertain digit. So the, in a balance, it's giving you your uncertainty for you. You don't have to guess. So on a digital readout, you record all values with the understanding that the last number written is in fact your uncertainty. And if a thermometer reads close to the true temperature, it must be accurate or precise. See module 1b for review if you're confused on the difference between accuracy and precision. Just showing you kind of what your report sheet will look like. It's going to have you calculate the temperature um, in Celsius, or measure the temperature in Celsius at room temperature in ice bath and a boiling water bath and convert to Kelvin. So, example, my office right now is at 24.2 degrees C. If I want to convert that to Kelvin, 24.2 degrees C plus 273.15. gives me a calculated answer of 297.35. This is precise to the tenths place. This is to the hundredths. So my final answer is going to be to the tenths place, which means I need to round this to 297.4. And don't forget your units. You'll do that again for the ice bath and boiling water bath. On the report sheet, you've measured the width and length of your lab manual in centimeters. Let's just make up numbers. I have no idea how many um, centimeters it actually is, but let's say it's 15.2 centimeters in width and 37.9 centimeters in length. I want the area for that. Area is length times width. So 15.2 centimeters times 37.9 centimeters. Gives me 576.08. This has three sig figs. This has three sig figs. We're following sig fig number of sig fig rules because we're doing multiplication. So my final answer can have three sig figs, 576. But can't forget units. Centimeters times centimeters gives me centimeters squared. And what is that area in inches? I've got 576 centimeters squared. I know that one inch is 2.54 centimeters, but I need centimeters squared. So what I'm actually going to plug in my calculator is 576 divided by 2.54 squared. which is going to give me 89.28, but I need three sig figs, 
this is exact. It's three anyway, but it's, it's exact, so it doesn't look like my sig fig. So I'm going to round this to 89.3, and then my units become inches squared. And part C, mass of empty container, mass with water, mass of water experimental, and your percent error. So you're going to go ahead and calculate those things using density of 1 to calculate between your mass to your um, volume. It also wants you to record the mass of five drops of water and then calculate drops per mil. It tells you in the handout how many mils it assumes, how many drops it takes per one mil. So you need to go ahead and calculate this conversion and see how you guys can get there. So let's say it's 15 drops per one mil. If I had five drops, I should be able to use this conversion to calculate this out. How many mils did I actually add? On your post lab, what temperature should the temperature ice bath be? This is specifically stated in the, um, or described in your handout. If this was not your temperature, explain why. What could cause it to not be as cold as it said it was? What is the percent error for your temperature of the boiling water? Go ahead and calculate that. Which method of measuring volume was the least accurate? Your beaker graduate cylinder and explain. Truthfully, beakers should be less accurate than graduated cylinders, but it really comes down to student technique. If you did get it less accurate, well, think about the graduations on the glassware. How, how um, precise is a graduated cylinder marked compared to a beaker? And what is the volume with the correct number of sig figs and why in this picture here? So we've got a graduated cylinder in milliliters. We see a 10 and a 15. So this must be 11, 12, 13, and 14. So we know x is about 14 mils, but that's not precise enough, right? We're going to have to estimate our uncertain digit. So 14 point what? Or 13 point what? Somewhere in there. And burettes, burettes are actually read um, a little bit backwards. We're not going to deal again with this again until chapter six, or experiment six. But burettes are a to-deliver device, so the liquid is actually in here, but the numbers go down. So what we actually record is what we call your empty volume. So we see here, one and a two, which means each of these graduations is a point. So 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1 etc. And I can see here, if I go straight across from 1.2, x is a little bit bigger than 1.2, but it's smaller than 1.3. So x is going to be equal to 1.2 something. And don't forget your units. I really hope this helps you guys um, be a little more successful or a little more prepared for lab one. Good luck.